All right, well, let's open our Bibles to Genesis chapter 25, 25th chapter in Genesis. We will get through <clears throat> 25 and 26 this evening. And if you read ahead, uh, then you know we've got the story of Jacob and Esau, uh, the, the, the infamous story of, of Jacob and Esau in front of us. Uh, now, I think that it goes without saying that one of the most difficult doctrines for you and I to, to sort of reconcile in our minds is, is this idea, this doctrine of election. You know, the idea that God somehow sovereignly chooses certain people to become his own. As Paul said, you know, we were chosen in Christ before the foundations of the world were ever laid. And so here in chapter 25, we're going to see, we're going to discover the Lord electing someone to be his own. And it is interesting that when the apostle um, Paul in the book of Romans was seeking to instruct us on this doctrine of election, that this chapter here is one of the very chapters he chose out of the Old Testament uh, to instruct us in this issue of election. Now, um, from where we sit or stand this doctrine seems to be um, somewhat unfair. I, you know, the idea that God picks some people. Well, why didn't he pick everybody? And, and why did he pick this person as opposed to that person over there? And at the end of the day, because none of us are able to think as God thinks, and because none of us are able to dwell in that sphere where the Lord dwells, it is then... Um, rather silly for us, it is rather nonsensical for us to bring challenges or accusations against God concerning this matter. Now, uh, remember that Paul's whole point in Romans 9 was, look, God chose Jacob and Esau before these boys were ever born. He chose them before they ever had an opportunity to do good or, or anything to do bad. Before any of that, God sovereignly chose one over the other. Now, as we see the end of their lives in the weeks ahead, it becomes very clear to us why the Lord chose one over the other. And I think it's on this point where the student of the word of God can begin to feel a degree of relief over this struggle of election. As you study the full counsel of God, you, you, you come to, and, and as you come to trust the Lord, you come to understand a couple of things. That God is the self-stated Alpha and Omega. He is the beginning. He is the end. He is outside of time. He has seen the end of the movie, if you will. All right? Now that's difficult to wrestle down, but again, as you come to an understanding of the full counsel of God, you begin to trust and appreciate that God has seen the end of the movie in your life. All right? And so because of that, you know, again, Isaiah 55, we don't think as God thinks, but because of that, it's not so much that, that God is choosing some and rejecting others in the way that we think of it, but it's because God knows in his omniscience, who is going to respond to him and who is not going to respond to him, all right? Now, the Bible, again, full counsel of God, Second Peter 3, clearly tells us that God's desire is that all should come to a saving knowledge of Christ and that all should come to a repentance. So it's not God choosing as much as, as it is. In, in, in my mind, God's sort of knowing because he's seen the end of the movie, who's going to choose him and who is not, all right? And so at the end of the day, I think we can simplify this doctrine of election very, very simply. Choose Christ, and you'll come to discover that he has chosen you, all right? Now, um, again, really the point of the matter is that everything we know about God's choosing, it is always right. It is always good. When all is said and done... We will look at God's choices and say, yep, that was a pretty solid choice over there. All right, again, the Bible tells us one day our testimony will be he has done all things well. So it's one of those doctrines that even after reading it and even after looking at the totality of Scripture, even after getting it a bit, we still just sort of scratch our heads there. 
but yet we cannot, at the end of the day, bring challenges, uh, challenges against the rightness of God concerning his choices. So, beginning then in verse 1, let's begin to get after it. Um, Abraham's going to take another wife here, so remember where we're picking this up, that Sarah had died uh, the last time we were together. So looking at verses 1 through 4, let's pick it up in chapter 25. Now, Abraham took another wife whose name was Keturah. She bore to him uh, Zimran and Jokshan and Medan and, and Midian and, and Ishbak and Shua. And Al Pacino would take a liking to him. Uh, then Jokshan became the father of Sheba and Dedan. And, and the sons of Dedan were Asherim and Latushim and uh, Lumim. And you can butcher these names as well as I can. Now the sons of Midian, by the way, he will be a thorn in Israel's side in the future. The Midianites will. Uh, the sons of Midian were Ephah and Ephur and Hanak and Abida and Elda. All these were the sons of Keturah. All right, now, there's a real possibility that he actually married this gal before Sarah even passed away because we'll see here in verse 6 that her sons are referred to as the sons of the concubine. All right? And when you go to First Chronicles, as it's giving us the chronology of some of these things, it also there mentions Keturah as a concubine. And that word took there, or taken in verse 1, uh, took another wife, had taken another wife. That's really um, in the Hebrew in the past tense, so this took place before. So that's the score on that. Now, uh, these guys, these sons that, that Abraham had by Keturah, they are not important in terms of, of the plan of redemption as Genesis is seeking to unfold. The only reason they are mentioned is because they are the offspring of Abraham. So they're mentioned, but then we're going to see they quickly drop off the scene, never to be heard from again, because they do not figure into the direct line of the Messiah, again, that the Old Testament is seeking to unfold. So they're mentioned, but they drop off the scene. Well, then in verse 5, uh, now Abraham gave all, all that he had to Isaac, but, now here's a contrast here, but to the sons of the concubines, Abraham gave gifts while he was still living and sent them away from his son Isaac eastward to the land of the east. So he, he gave them some token gifts, but he gives all to Isaac. All right, now Abraham is very careful as he's setting his house in order here before he dies, that he's, he's, he's really just being the faithful patriarch to the very end here. And he's really making it clear that, look, there, there's a difference between Isaac and all of the other sons that, that Abraham had. That Isaac, again, in review here, past couple of, of studies, he is to be the son of the promise. And being the son of the promise, this is the one through whom the covenant is going to be realized, right? Isaac's going to have my blessing, he's saying, pl placed upon him. Isaac's going to get all of the stuff. Now, picking it up in verse 7, uh, we now here discover Abraham, whom we've been studying for quite some time now. We now discover his earthly journey coming to an end. Verse 7, these are all the years of Abraham's life that he lived, 175 years. Abraham breathed his last and died in a ripe old age. Now, there's a couple of phrases I want you to underline here because they come into the English without the fullness of the meaning. Here we go, okay? So Abraham breathed his last and died in a ripe old age, an old man full of years, underline full of years, you might have satisfied with life there, and he was, underline this, gathered to his people. Okay, gathered to his people. Uh, verse 9. Then his sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar the Hittite, facing Mamre. The field which Abraham purchased from the sons of Heth, there Abraham was buried with Sarah, his wife. It came about after the death of Abraham that God blessed his son Isaac, and Isaac lived by Beer Lahairoi. All right, so Abraham passes, and again, a couple of phrases there in verse 8 that... that that we miss in, in the English a bit. This full of years, that Abraham was full of years, this does not refer to uh, the idea that he was old chronologically. In the Hebrew, this means he lived a very full life, a very rich life, a very satisfied life, a life full of years, all right? And then you've got gathered to his people. And we can pass over this and not really understand what's going on here, but, but this does not mean 
does not mean that he was buried with his people, all right? The idea in the Hebrew here is that he is gathered into that spiritual realm with those who have died in, in the faith. I'm going to think Noah, think Enoch, think the sons of Seth, and so forth, all right? Now, this is another Bible study in Luke 16, but what is being spoken of here when he's gathered to his people is, is that he is gathered to what, what we call the realm of the dead, all right? And again, another Bible study in Luke 16, but I'll be brief here. The realm of the dead is a temporary dwelling place prior to the completion of Christ's victory at the cross, all right? Now, we we sometimes ask the question, did Jesus go to hell before the ascension? No, he did not, because hell is a permanent place. This realm of the dead is, is what we call, in the Old Testament, Sheol, and in the New Testament, it's called Hades, okay? So this is the realm of the dead. Hades isn't talking about hell, all right? Hades and Sheol, Sheol, Old Testament, Hades, New Testament, are talking about this realm of the dead where those who died prior to the cross went, all right? Now, if you read Luke 16, you'll discover there that this area was divided into two, um, two temporary places. There was a place of blessing and a place of judgment, this place of blessing is called Abraham's bosom. This place of judgment is, is more like a prison, all right? If you look at Ephesians 4 and 1 Peter 3, you'll discover that uh, when Christ, prior to the ascension, after he rose from the dead, that he went down to this, this temporary dwelling place to announce his victory over sin and then to take all those Old Testament saints who were in paradise into the heavenly realm with him. Okay, so I'm not trying to complicate this for you theologically, but people will oftentimes ask what happened to the Old Testament saints who were saved by faith prior to the cross. Well, they went to this place called Abraham's bosom, all right? And so again, Sheol in the Old Testament, Hades in the New Testament refers to the realm of the dead, and those who were believers will, will be in this par- were in this paradise part until Christ took them upon victory of the cross. And the rest of these guys will eventually find their place in the judgment, uh, uh, the future judgment, the permanent hell. Uh, and you can discover some of that in the book of Revelation. So uh, that's where it, th- that is what is meant in a, a, a three-minute nutshell, if you will, that Abraham was gathered to his people. He went to that place where those who had died in the faith went before him and and it was a very good place so Abraham dies at 175 uh, safe to say that he was uh, no doubt one of the most important men in the scripture and it it should really encourage our hearts and and I'm going to going to mention this now in summary um, because we've taken more than a few chapters to study this man and and I want you to, to walk away with with really the big takeaway from his life we've discovered that this man this father of the faith, this elevated guy, that man, he had problems like everybody else. He had problems. And yet, the Lord blessed him and used him in a powerful way. Now, why did the Lord bless him? Why was the Lord able to use this man in such a a mighty way? Was it because he was some tremendous intellect? No. Was it because the guy just had some mad skills? I mean, was it because he was great? No. The Lord was able to use this man, the predominant characteristic in the life of this man and also in the life of David, was that every time he fell, he got back up and he allowed the Lord to correct him and move him right back to square one. Every time he got off track, right? And this is not new. You've been with us, all right? Every time he swerved off the path, he got right back up and he allowed God to deal with him. He yielded to the Lord, he learned from the Lord, and he leaned back into the Lord, all right? And because this was the predominant characteristic that shaped this man's life, getting up every time after he fell, getting back to God, he was brought to a place of strength and faith that we saw evident in in Genesis chapter 22 when he went forward to sacrifice his own son. And so that, friends, as we leave Abraham now, that is really the difference between those, those who are used of God and those who are left unused. We all screw up. 
We all mess up, right? James tells us we all stumble many times. If we desire to grow in God, to be used of God, then when we blow it, and we will, and we just get back up, offer that broken moment to the Lord, right? And we move on. And that becomes the pattern of our Christian behavior, all right? Not falling under condemnation, not hearing the voice of the flesh or the devil, but simply, we're, we're going to blow it. 1 John 1, 1.8, he who says he is without sin lies. We're all going to blow it on our way to the resurrection. And hopefully progressively less and less as the Lord transforms us. But you just get back up, offer the broken moment to the Lord, and man, you move on. And if you can continue to do that, you will be used mightily of the Lord. And Abraham's life shows us that. You with me? All right. So Abraham passes off the scene, and so now the torch is passed to Isaac. He's going to take stage very briefly here in chapter 26. And, and, and again, not, not a lot written about the man, but, but before we get to that, and before we get to Jacob and Esau, we're going to blow through rather quickly some of this next part here, all right? Because we're going to be uh, essentially dealing with Ishmael and his departure from the pages of Scripture, picking it up in verse 12. Uh, now, the, uh, these are the records of the generations of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar the Egyptian, Sarah's maid, bore to Abraham. And these are the names of the sons of Ishmael by their names in the order of their birth. Nebaioth, the firstborn of Ishmael, and Kedar, and Abdeel, and uh, Mibsami, and Mishma, and Duma, and Massa, and Hadad, you're not that funny, and Tima, Jeter, uh, Nafish, and Funky Cold Kadima. And these are the sons of Ishmael, and these are their names by their villages and by their camps. Uh, Twelve princes according to their tribes. These are the years of the life of Ishmael. Uh, watch this, 137 years, life, uh, lifespan getting shorter now, right? And he breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people. Uh, they settled from Havilah to Shur, which is east of Egypt, as one goes toward Assyria, and he settled in defiance of all his relatives. Now again, Ishmael, not important. His offspring aren't important as far as the line of the Messiah, uh, the Messiah and, and the redemption goes. So this is really uh, the curtain call for Ishmael here being mentioned in um, the word of God. Now, um, again, because of that, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time here. I do think it's interesting, if you remember our study back in the flood, where part of the flood you remember with seismic brevity here, that there was this water canopy that surrounded the earth, and the ages prior to the flood were just 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, 700 years. These guys were living a long time, the the flood brought forth springs from below and there was also involved in the flood this crashing this breaking of this water canopy that then came down Uh, man was no longer protected from cosmic and solar radiation as a result of that and now we see the ages of men tapering off uh, in fairly short order abraham 175 ishmael now 137. So I think it's interesting to see that, and you will um, see these uh, ages continue to shorten right around to the lifespan that we enjoy today. All right, well, picking it up in verse 19, now we get to another one of these famous tales in Genesis, that of Jacob and Esau, and boy, uh, hey, the Lord has a lot to show us here. Let's look at verse 19. Now, these are the records of the generation of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham became the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Paddan Aram, the sister of Laban, the Aramean, to be his wife. Isaac prayed, underline that right there. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren. Kind of sounds like a repeat of mom and dad, doesn't it, right? Uh, and the Lord answered him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. Now, uh, understand that even the son of the promise does not have the perfect life, right? I mean, even the son of the promise is not just skating through life with no struggles or, or troubles whatsoever, even as you and I, as children of the promise, should not expect to be skating through life without grief and hassle. In fact, it's those griefs and hassles and, and trials and tribulations that God uses to move us along. And that, that's another Bible study in James 1. Uh, now, when you run the numbers, and, and we'll see these down in verse 26, in a minute, we're going to recognize that they were married, Isaac and Rebekah were, for about 20 years. 
all right? So they've been trying to have kids for 20 years. Now, apparently, to Isaac's credit, he had, he had learned an important lesson in what not to do from his dad, right? Now, you remember when Abraham was at this point, and, and, he, and Sarah was barren, and his wife said, you know, Genesis 16, honey, why don't you sleep with the young handmaiden? Well, all right, I suppose if I have to. And, of course, you know, really threw the household into turmoil for quite a few years there. So, so Isaac is smart enough not to do that deal again, and so he does really the best thing that he could have done, and that, of course, is to pray for his wife. Instead of running out and grabbing another wife, rather he takes the, the high road, he takes the spiritual route, if you will, and he prays for her, and so the Lord answers his prayer. Now, again, why does the Lord answer his prayer? Again, was it because he's such a faithful guy? Was it because he's just such a, a faithful prayer warrior? And, or, or because he's, he's claiming the promises of God and all these kinds of things, right? No. The reason why God answered this man's prayer is because this man is praying in accordance to the will of God, you see. It was the will of God that through he and Rebekah the seed would come forth. Well, she's got to have a kid, right? And that's, that's God's promise, so, so that's what I'm going to pray in, all right? And so he could pray with great faith, and he could pray with great confidence not because he was such a great guy that he could somehow manipulate God like some cosmic genie and, and get him to do what he wanted him to do, but because he was praying consistently with what God's will was for his life. And this is what John says in 1 John, right? That look, if we are praying in the will of God, if we are praying for those things that are within the realm of God's will, then we can ask what we want and we can have absolute confidence that we are going to receive the answer to our prayer. And so he prays for his wife. Now, you'll notice there's a problem though, picking it up in verse 22. But the children struggled together within her. And she said, if it is so, why then, why then am I this way? So she went to inquire of the Lord. Pretty interesting characteristics developing in this couple, right? So now she's got a struggle. What does she do? She goes to the Lord. So uh, this is a difficult pregnancy, evidently, that she's going through. Now, of course, the Lord's going to tell her, we're going to see in a minute, the Lord's going to tell her, hey, hey, you got two nations within you that don't really care a whole heck of a lot for each other, and that's what the problem is. And so, you know, Jacob and Esau, they're, they're somehow wrestling around in there, and it's very uncomfortable for her, and she doesn't, she doesn't know what's going on. She is confused. No doubt at this point, she's worried about the health of what she thinks is her child. Again, she doesn't know she's having twins at the moment. But what I want you to mark, again, in a confused, worried state, what does she do? But she gives herself to prayer. So, we can see what is developing here in the household of Isaac is that this, this is evidently a, a very spiritually healthy family. Now, we're going to discover they're far from perfect, but when this couple... And they don't end well, but we'll get to that next week. The, the, the Isaac and Rebecca are a picture of a couple of Christians that start so strong but just don't finish. And uh, a bit of a teaser for next week. But So they're far from perfect, but when the couple at this point, when they're going through some struggles, they need a child, what does the husband do? What does the wife do? They pray. And so spiritually, at least at this point in their lives, there, there seems to be a very healthy environment that Isaac has going on here in his house. So Rebecca prays, and let's uh, pick it up in 23 and see what the Lord has to say to that prayer. So the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb and two peoples will be separated from your body and one people shall be stronger than the other and underline this, this is the prophecy, and the older shall serve the younger. Now, did she share this with Isaac? We really don't know. The text doesn't tell us. I mean, we would assume all indications are that this is a fairly healthy marriage. You would have thought that if God spoke to the wife concerning something this significant, right, 
that she would share it with her husband. Now, she probably did share it with Isaac, but I get a feeling that Isaac just kind of blows her off, and I get that feeling because what the text is going to tell us as we move on down the road here, all right? The text is going to, going to um, uh, let us know that Isaac just doesn't receive what, what she was sharing with the guy. And for a number of reasons, one of which is it's, it's going to turn out he favors the other, but it goes so contrary against the cultural norm. Now, the cultural norm was the firstborn child rules the roost. All right? That's the way we do it around here. That's the way we've been doing it for thousands of years, Isaac is thinking. And, and now you're coming around here telling me, Rebecca, that, that the younger is going to rule the roost? I don't think so. You know, it's, it's been a rough pregnancy, honey. I mean, you know, you're, you've been eating some weird food. You know, all right, you know, so who knows what's going on? You think it's God? I think it's a little guess, all right? So uh, at any rate, we're going to discover that Isaac doesn't really receive it, and he's kind of rebellious to this whole plan that God is setting up here. That's what we're going to discover in the text, and that he plays favorites with Esau. Well, then here come the twins in verse 24. When her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. Now the first came forth red, all over like a hairy garment, and they, this guy's an ape, we'll get to that, and they named him Esau. Now we're going to see this kid was so hairy, all right, I, I mean, that, that Jacob's going to Gonna, his mom's going to crazy glue goat skin to him, all right? So, so they can trick blind dear old dad into believing he's Esau. We'll get to that next week. But this is one hairy guy you got going on here, man. I, I, I mean, this is Chewbacca, all right? And, and so they named him Esau, which means hairy. It means thick-haired, if you will. Verse 26. Afterward, his brother came forth with his hand. Now, this is great. Are you, this is classic. Afterward, his brother came forth with his hand, holding on to Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. And now here's our time marker. Isaac was 60 years old when she gave birth to them. Now you can imagine. I mean, Jacob sticks his hand out of the womb, grabs Esau and says, you get back in here, all right? You know, I'm number one. I'm going to be the eldest here. So, so they call him Jacob, which means in the Hebrew, heel catcher, all right? So both of these boys, consistent with what we've seen in the pages of Genesis thus far in the Hebrew tradition, they were named after the circumstances surrounding their birth. Now, heel catcher was not a compliment in any way, all right? It means schemer. It means conniver, all right? It meant that this is a kid you don't want to turn your back on. I mean, you turn your back on this kid, man, your hubcaps are going to be missing from your car, all right? He's that kind of a guy. And that is how his life in the beginning starts to develop. Well, then verse 27 fast forwards this a bit. When the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the field. But Jacob was a peaceful man living in tents. Now, Isaac, lo now here comes the problem right here, all right? Parents, pay attention. Now, Isaac loved Esau because he had a taste for game, but Rebecca loved Jacob, and it is this dysfunctionality that is going to launch uh, a, just a, a world of hurt within this family. Now, once again, understand that Paul's whole point in Romans 9 is that God had chosen Jacob over Esau before any of these boys had the opportunity to do anything wrong. And I know I'll get this question uh, did yesterday, but in Romans chapter 9, verse 13, Paul uses some very strong language in his commentary of this that doesn't sit, uh, doesn't sit well with us. Quoting Malachi, quoting the Lord in Malachi, Paul says, but, but I have hated Esau. God says, I have hated Esau, but I have loved Jacob. And everybody wants to know what that means, but again, context, context, Context: When you go to Malachi, and when you go to Romans 9, the idea isn't Esau himself, but the, the, the people group that would descend from him, the, e, the Edomites. What the language is, con, uh, is, is really communicating is that Jacob I have received, and Esau I have rejected. In other words, I've received Jacob. He's going to be the one through whom this covenant is going to flow, and I have rejected Esau for that purpose. All right. Now, early on, 
these two boys had very, very different temperaments. And of course, it's always interesting when a couple looks at their kids and my goodness, they're so different. I mean, they come from the very same gene pool and yet somehow they just don't act the same and they don't, they don't think the same way. And, and Sarah and I are certainly ex- experiencing that with Max and Zoe right now. So, so here are two boys, they were twins, and yet they are very different. Now, the father, right, would naturally gravitate towards, you know, the manlier of the two, you know, the father is going to gravitate to the hunter or the athlete or whatever, and, and that's, that's who Esau was. He was the tough guy hanging out in the field, eating raw meat and all of these kinds of things, right? And then Jacob, it says that he was a peaceful man there in verse 27. You might have plain or quiet or mild in your translation there. Now, that does not mean that he was effeminate. It does not mean that he was a girly boy or a sissy uh, in any way, all right? Because in the weeks ahead, we're going to see that this dude wrestles an angel all night long, all right? Now, now if you've ever wrestled before, I I can't imagine what it would be like to wrestle all night long, let alone with an angel, no less, who is probably a Christophany, a pre-incarnate in parents of Christ. And finally, this angel has to dislocate the guy's hip in order to break free from whatever hold he has upon him. So Jacob was a tough guy, but he's not as tough as Esau. So he's tough, but he's not as tough as Esau. Next time we get together, you know, we're going to notice that when, when Esau says, I'm going to kill him, everybody pretty much believes it. Yeah I, yeah, I think he can take him. You know, I think he can kill him. So Jacob wasn't a pansy. And yet, I want you to see something very, very interesting here. And it points to the dual nature that you and I share um, today because Jacob does give us a picture of the believer. We'll explore that in a bit. But really this idea behind, and underline that word, the idea behind peaceful or quiet or mild or plain there in verse 27. Very interestingly here, this is the same Hebrew word, the very same Hebrew word that the Lord used of Job when he was speaking to Satan and said, have you considered my servant Job? And he said that he was blameless. Blameless. It's the very same Hebrew word used here and a very similar word used of Noah in Genesis 6. So there is a sense here where, listen, Jacob is being presented as compliant. All right? And so in Jacob, particularly early on, we see the same struggle going on that we see in ourselves. That we have these kind of dueling natures within us. Paul talks about this in Galatians 5 and and Romans 7, how that our our flesh drives with the spirit, that, that the flesh and the spirit are always warring against one another. So Jacob, in the flesh, he has this tendency to be sort of a a schemer, and yet God is presenting him as compliant. Now, in fairness to Jacob, it's really his mother, we'll see this next week, it's his mother who drives him and pushes him into this scheming nature. We'll see that um, next week. Now, now in Esau, there is no spiritual nature to compete. I mean, the, the dude's all flesh. And so what we're going to see play out is a picture of the believer in Jacob and a picture of the unbeliever in Esau. What we've got at the end of the day are the parents playing favorites. Isaac gravitates towards Esau because he's the manly man, right? And then Rebecca, well, you know, who wouldn't love a, a mild, what mother wouldn't love a mild, compliant child? And, and so what you have beginning to develop in this household is division and turmoil because mom and dad don't have the sense to treat these kids with equal affection. And as parents, we have to be so very careful on this point, and we're going to see the result of that um, in the weeks ahead. So, so mom and dad are feeding division, and it all comes to a head now here, picking it up in verse 29. When Jacob had cooked stew, Esau came in from the field, and he was famished. And Esau said to Jacob, please let me have a swallow of that red stuff there, for I am famished. Therefore, his name was called Edom, which means red. Uh, but Jacob said, first sell me your birthright. Esau said, Well, behold, I am about to die. So of what use then is the birthright to me? Now, before you get all hung up on this text, understand that Esau could care less about the birthright. 
He's not a spiritual dude. This isn't something he values or thinks of, okay? Uh, And so Jacob said, first swear to me. So he swore to him and he sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew and he ate and drank and rose and went on his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Now, um, the birthright was the person that would take over the, really the spiritual headship of the family once the father had passed. Now, Jacob was nobody's fool. I mean, Jacob was a schemer, right? That's, that's what he struggled with in the flesh. And Jacob knew that although it was a spiritual right, that it also carried with it material blessings as well. Because the spiritual blessing was the covenant of Abraham, and part of the covenant of Abraham was what? All of Palestine. Right? And so if I have the birthright, Jacob's thinking, I, I get all of Palestine. And so Esau here is really a picture, as I alluded to, kind of mid-explanation there. Esau really gives us a picture of the natural man, of the unbeliever. You know, he's ready to sell his soul for a bowl of red beans and rice, right? I mean, he, he's ready to sell all that he has because he's hungry today. Now, natural man, and and by the way, if you want a great commentary on this, uh, look at 1 Corinthians 2. Uh, Paul expands uh, upon this at some length, all right? But natural man, who Esau is a picture of here, natural man will sacrifice next week. Natural man will sacrifice eternity as long as the flesh can be content today. Natural man's default is not to think any further out in front of him than the end of his nose, all right? As long as, as, long as the flesh is satisfied today, natural man could care less what he is sacrificing in the future, all right? Now, Jacob, not a whole lot better here because he's scheming, wait for it, he's scheming for what God has already given him. You see, God has already given him the birthright. God has already said there in verse 23, the elder is going to serve the younger. So here he is scheming, you know, know, I know that my brother, he usually comes back kind of hungry, so I'm going to make something that he really likes, and I'm going to make it red because he digs that stuff, and then I'm going to trick him, and I'm going to get him to give me his birthright for a pot of beans, right? And so he's got the scam all set up, and then back to mom and dad now, picking it up in verse 1 of chapter 26. Now, there was a famine in the land besides the previous famine that had occurred in the days of Abraham. So Isaac went to Gerar to Abimelech, king of the Philistines. The Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Stay in the land which I shall tell you. So journey in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I will give all these lands, and I will establish the oath which I swore to your father Abraham. I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven, and will give your descendants all these lands, and by your descendants all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed me and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. All right, now, um, God, for the first time that we know of, is appearing to Isaac, uh, confirming this covenant. Now, I'm sure that his dad, you know, probably talked to Abraham probably all the time. Yeah, you know, I, I had lunch with God over here, and, you know, and I, and I you know, God spoke to me over there, and, and I saw him over here. But as far as we know, thus far, this has not happened for Isaac, Okay. And so here is Isaac, and he and his family, they're heading south. And and remember, again, the last time his family headed south, bad things happened, right? They picked up Hagar in Egypt and out popped Hamas, right? A profound truckload of problems. So so God cuts him off at the pass, says, hey, no, no, don't you go into Egypt. You stay put, you stay in the land. This is the land I have given you. Now, Here he has a tremendous spiritual experience. I want you to see this, man. This is heady stuff, is it not? Again, imagine God showing up in your bedroom tonight and saying, you, okay, I've picked you and the whole world's going to be blessed through you and your offspring's going to have all these countries. I mean, this is a high deal. This is a serious crest that this guy's riding on, right? And now you would think that he would come away 
as far as we know, first time for him, you would think he would come away from this encounter with just a renewed commitment to serve God and a, and a renewed commitment to give his life to holy living. Now, no sooner does he have, no sooner does he have this great spiritual experience, well then notice what happens in verse 6. And some of you are going to recognize this again. You're going to shake your head. So Isaac lived in Gerar when the men of the place asked... Now, the nut doesn't fall too far from the tree. Watch this. When the men of the place asked about his wife, he said, She is my sister. For he was afraid to say my wife, thinking the men of the place might kill me on account of Rebekah, for she is beautiful. It came about when he had been there a long time. (laughs) This is a classic verse. Uh, particularly in the King James, that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out through a window and saw, and behold, Isaac was caressing his wife, Rebekah. In the King Jimmy, Isaac was sporting his wife, Rebekah. Then Abimelech called Isaac and said, Behold, certainly, now he's watching this whole thing, certainly she is your wife. How then did you say she is my sister? And Isaac said to him, Because I said I might die on account of her. And Abimelech said, What is this you have done to us? One of the people might easily have lain with your wife, and you would have brought guilt upon us. So Abimelech charged all the people, saying, He who touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Now, again, the nut doesn't fall to far from the tree. If you've been with us, here we go with the sister deal again, right? Now remember, we encountered this twice with his father in our earlier studies, and we noted there, Genesis 12 and Genesis 20, that that as Abraham could not quite get around to repenting of this sin, it should strike us as, with no surprise that we now see the same sin uh, surfacing in the life of his son. And I'm assuming there's no need to expand that application, right? So he has this tremendous spiritual experience, and then he falls right into sin. You see how the Word of God is setting this up? This is why the Bible warns us, take heed lest you think you stand that you end up falling, right? 1 Corinthians 10, Proverbs 16. Pride comes before the fall. The moment that you think, hey man, I'm riding the spiritual wave and, you know, I'm God's man or or I'm God's woman or whatever, the next thing you know, you're going to be doing something stupid if you're not careful. And so the word of God would have us to take note that it is after these very positive spiritual experiences that we really need to guard our hearts. Because from time to time, the Lord will come along and allow this to show you you're not quite the spiritual legend you think you are, right? All right. Now, uh, notice in verse 8 that it said he was caressing his wife. Again, King James says sporting. The New Living says fondling. Uh, you know, the, the Hebrew word has the idea of, of playfulness. Uh, the context, there's sort of a sexual undertone here. And, and so Abimelech somehow sees this, and he's no idiot, right? He quickly gets the score. I mean, they're probably making out is what they're doing or something to that degree. So, so Abimelech figures... She's the dude's wife unless this is just a weird family. But again, though, this gives us an indication, and and this I think is kind of cool. Remember, this gives us an indication that that despite their imperfections, that this this was a pretty good marriage, right? I mean, they've been married now for about 20 years years and yet there's still this playfulness and and there's still this energy within the relationship well then well then notice now in verse 12 and and man guys people talk about you know the new testament the the kinder gentler new testament god and there's no grace of of the in the old testament god man just i talk I, i don't know how to tell you this but other other than Talk about the grace of God. Watch what happens after he messes up in verse 12. Uh, Now Isaac sowed in the land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. And the man became rich and continued to grow richer until he became very wealthy, for he had possessions of flocks and herds and a great household, so that the Philistines envied him. Now all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham his father the Philistines stopped up, uh, stopped up by filling them with dirt. I mean, that's a dirty trick, right? I mean, the Philistines are going to give us a picture of the world here. 
okay? And they're running around just, you know, throwing dirt in these wells and filling them up. And I think we need to understand very quickly, um, in this culture, the, uh, you're talking about the Arabian desert here. These wells were gold. These wells of water were gold. And that's why every time there was a famine, we saw it with Abraham. We're going to see it uh, with Isaac. Well, we did see it when he cuts them off at the pass. That's why whenever there's a famine in the land, everybody wants to flee to Egypt. Why? Because there's a big river there called the Nile right? But up here they didn't have that, and so these wells are huge. They figure prominently into the story. Just wanted to explain that to you. But notice, friends, the great grace of God here. Here's Isaac just messed up, and yet God is prospering this man, and he's building up this nation he will call his own. And so those who subscribe to this idea that the Old Testament God is mean and rough, and grace is only in the New Testament God, uh, these people haven't really read the Old Testament. So God is just just prospering this man. Now, there is a profound picture here for us in the filling up of these wells. So I really want you to get this. This is, this is huge, all right? In the scriptures, water speaks of, symbolizes the word of God. Paul tells us in Ephesians 5 that we are to wash ourselves in the water of the word of God. Christ tells us in John 7 that if if anyone hungers and thirsts, come to me and drink. Out of him will come rivers of living water. All right, interestingly, down in verse 19, the water is going to be described coming forth from one of these wells. It it will say flowing or springing water, but in, in the Hebrew, the word is living All right, so in the Hebrew, we've got living water springing from these wells. Now, the picture is this, all right? Water, it speaks to the word of God. Now, as God is establishing his people in the land he's given them, the Philistines, again, a picture of the world, they want to come in and fill these wells with dirt and stop them up. This is sort of the Old Testament version of the parable of the soils in Matthew 13 where the enemy comes and, and snatches away the seeds that God has sown. Listen, when you, when you, tune in, when you are going to the well of living water, when you are going to the well of the word of God, there are people and there are forces that want to come along and stop that up. They want to throw dirt at you. They want to discourage you. They want to dry that well up. The wells of the word of God in your life, all right? Wherever you, wherever you may be, Sunday morning, Monday night, hopefully, th- hopefully throughout the weeks in your homes, uh, small groups, whatever, these wells of the word of God, they are precious, they are life-giving. The enemy knows this, and he will do anything to keep you from going to these wells. He will use circumstances, activity, busyness, laziness. He will use people. He will literally bend over backwards to keep you out of the word of God. He'll fill your life with religious activity if he can keep you out of the word of God. All right? Some of you experience this to one degree or another, probably right around Monday at five, right? You feel that that pull or that tug to not come. You know what I'm talking about? You meet with that resistance and maybe you have that happening on Sunday morning too, right? And, and, and he has his way with some of us, doesn't he? And we're not consistent with, with coming to the wells of, of the living water of the word of God. Man, I am just telling you, I, I know life can get tough. I know there are, are circumstances from time to time. But you get to wherever you go to church, you get there every week. And try the best that you can to come here as well. These wells are precious. It is that which transforms you. All right. Uh, So man, uh, pray on that in the quietness of your hearts this week. All right. Well, picking it up again in verse 16, we read, then Abimelech said to Isaac, go away from us for you are too powerful for us. And Isaac departed from there and camped in the valley of Gerar and settled there. Now watch this. 
Then Isaac, now Isaac, he is a well-digging fool, all right? Then Isaac dug again the wells of water which had been dug in the days of his father, Abraham, for the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham, and he gave them the same names which his father had given him. But when Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found there a well of living water in the Hebrew, the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with the herdsmen of Isaac, saying, the water is ours. So he named the well Essek because they contended with him. Then they dug another well, and they quarreled quarreled over it too so he named it Sitna he moved away from there and dug another well and they did not quarrel over it so he named it Rehoboth and he said uh, for he said at last the Lord has made room for us and we will be fruitful in the land then he went up from there to Beersheba the Lord appeared to him the same night and these wells God's just moving this guy sovereignly guys and we'll get to that and when he finally gets to where God wants him uh, then he, uh, the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of your father, Abraham. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bless you and multiply your descendants for the sake of my servant, Abraham. Now watch what's there when he finally gets to where God wants him. Watch what shows up in verse 25. So we built an altar there. Underline that. The altar shows up and, and called upon or worshipped the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there and there Isaac's servants dug a well. Um, now noticing back at the top of verse 16, go away from us, you are too powerful. Notice as God is prospering this family of the faith, they are beginning to now outnumber these other people groups. They're bigger than the Philistines, and we see Israel now, uh, or, or these people, uh, Jacob will, will really become Israel in name, but we see this people group now being galvanized by God into a nation. Now, here's what I want to draw your attention to. Here's what's super interesting, is how you see here that God is able to use the sinful actions of other people, the filling of the wells, right? How God is able to use the sinful actions of other people to move his people to where he wants them to be. Now, when you get out a map and you study these wells and the names and where they're located, God is just moving this guy closer and closer and closer to where he wants him. Now, these people that are bringing forth the sinful actions, they'll have to give an account before God. But it's interesting how God is able to use this. How many times in our lives can we look back and see how God was using some of these negative things or, or negative uh, relationships or circumstances in our lives to move us back to where we need to be? This dude went out to the edge. Gerar was the border. Next step, Egypt. All right? God says, nope, you're not going there, buddy. Stop. Hold it. And then he slowly moves him back to the negative actions of others to where he wants him to be. All right? And that's what God will oftentimes do in our lives as believers. He will use negative circumstances to bring us to where we want to be. A lot of times we, we get all caught up in prosperity and, and we get all caught up in the things of the world. And, and it takes, man, it takes a few knockdown blows for us to come back to reality and realize that, hey, hey, I need to let go of some of this stuff. Or I need to let go of some of these ideas I've, I've been passing off as the will of God here. <laughs> I, I just need to get back to, to fundamentally what God has called me to be all about. All right? Now, verse 24 and 25 there, he finally gets to where the Lord wants him, and we see the altar, we see worship, the Lord appears to him again. See, when he gets to where God wants him, we see communion and worship and fellowship with the Lord once again taking place in the life of the man. Now, why is this so important? Well, notice in verse 26, it's because the world's watching. All right. Then Abimelech came to him from Gerar with his advisor Ehuza and Phicol, the commander of his army. Again, Abimelech, uh, Phicol, those are titles, not names of men. Isaac said to them, why have you come to me since you hate me and have sent me away from you? They said, we see plainly, oh, that this would be said of us, right? We see plainly that the Lord has been with you. So we said, let there now be an oath between us, even between you and us, and let us make a covenant with you that you will do us no harm, just as we have not touched you and have done to you nothing but good and have sent you away in peace you are now blessed of the lord all right now when you are able to you know, the, the lesson of the word of god here is strong when you are able to handle contention 
when you are able to handle strife, when God has used the negative actions of others to move you to where he wants you to be, and you've responded to that properly, take note, the unbelievers are watching. And here the unbelievers were able to see this guy is handling adversity like nobody's business. And and in the midst of adversity, God is just blessing this man. Now, if you want to make an impact upon the unbelievers that are in your life, that are watching you, whether they realize it or not, pray that God, pray that God would give you the same grace here afforded to Isaac to get through the adversity with an attitude that draws others to want to know what in the world you've got going on in order that you might then have an open door to share the truth of Christ with them. All right, well, finally, let's wrap it up quickly uh, tonight, beginning in verse 30. Then he made a feast, and they ate and drank. In the morning they arose early and exchanged oaths. Then Isaac sent them away, and they departed from him in peace. Now it came about on the same day that Isaac's servants came in and told him about the well which they had dug and said to him, We have found water. So they called it Sheba. Therefore, the name of the city is Beersheba. To this day, when Esau was 40 years old, he married Judith, the daughter of Barry the Hittite, and Basemath, uh, the progenitor of quadratic equations, uh, and the daughter of Elon the Hittite, and they brought grief to Isaac and Rebekah. Now, I don't know what was going on with these two gals, but these two daughters-in-law were, were driving Isaac and Rebekah nuts, all right? is what they were doing. And and we're told it's a grievous situation. In the Hebrew, the idea is spiritually grievous. But you see, this is just consistent with Esau. And looking at it from this perspective, we're able to see that the reason the Lord rejected Esau for the purposes of having the covenant flow through him is that every time we see this guy, he is interested in pleasing himself. He was interested in being happy for the moment and he didn't really give any forethought as to what would come of the decisions that he would make. Now, notice there's no uh, communication noted here in the text that there's nothing said about him going to mom and dad uh, concerning the selection of these two gals, right? I mean, he's just, he just saw these two babes and thought, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to hitch their wagon. To, I'm going to hitch my wagon to these babes, and I don't really care what mom and dad say. They're going to have to get over it. And so we see Esau thinking of Esau. Now, there's been a lot of wonderful insights thus for us tonight. Let's sum it up very quickly. If we choose, in closing... If we choose to live our lives upon the trinity of darkness, me, myself, and I, then we are ordering our lives completely contrary to what biblical Christianity is all about. Biblical Christianity is about ordering our lives after the life of Christ who came not to be served, but to serve. At the end of the day, and this is so important, if we will guard the wells of the word of God in our lives, if we will seek to recognize those things in our lives, those activities in our lives, those people and those priorities that seek to stop up those wells and prevent us from going to those wells, if we can identify those and and push them aside, then we will drink freely of the living water, of the word of God, our thirst will be satisfied and we will discover ourselves squarely upon the path of of coming to know and love our creator and savior just more and more. And then the first, so get man, figure out what's stopping up those wells for you. Remove that from your life. Freely drink of the water and the fruit of that is going to be not only a growing peace and a growing joy, but also a growing capacity to see the hassles and the grief in our lives as further opportunities from the Lord to just move us further along in him, just like Isaac, leading us to that place in the kingdom that he has designed for us. All right, so the fruit of of going to the living water and and unstopping those wells in your life is you're going to have a growing peace, a growing joy, and and you're going to see adversity as opportunity. And then you handle it that way as the world watches that, 
you will be used of God in very powerful and profound ways to impact the lives of those people God has deliberately put within your, your path in your life. Not only here and now, but indeed for all of eternity. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you. Time and time again, when we go to your word, we are lifted up, encouraged, exhorted, corrected. God, there is so much for us here. I, I know that we are all in different places. I pray that you would um, poke the spirits in the hearts of each of these men and women here um, to meditate upon what it is that, that you communicated to them, what it is that they felt resonate with them. And, and God, I pray you would help us all to, to search our lives, to take a personal inventory and discover what circumstances or things or priorities or people are stopping us up from going to the wells of, of, of the, the living water in our lives. God, open those wells up. May they flow freely that we would become more and more like your son with each, each and every passing week. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen.